I'm Stephen John Drew from the official GunnaGeek.com show, a weekly geek news podcast that is a part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Welcome to episode 221 of Better Podcasting. On this show, we run down some time-saving podcasting shortcuts. In this week's Better Podcasting Download, we take a brief look at this year's Infinite Dial. And finally, in this week's Better Podback, we hear from Podchaser with an explanation about some recent social media activity. Lauren, start the show now, because I got some explaining to do to SP. Welcome to Better Podcasting. With a combined history of over a thousand episodes and starting as early as 2008, we are hobby podcasters through and through, just like you. That's why we are different. We minimize the money talk so that you can focus on building a better podcast. Here are the hosts for the show, Stephen John Drew and Stargate Pioneer. Welcome to an all new episode of Better Podcasting. I am Stephen John Drew, and I am pleased to say that SP's here again this week. I am. And, you know, as much as I would like to be the first voice that everybody hears during the main episode, I'm glad that you start off the episode every week because I don't have to worry about screwing up. I feel like we need to change this now. I really do. Mm, uh, you finally caught on after exactly. 220 episodes. I know. Uh, we're here to talk about some fun podcasts ideas of how you can make things a little bit easier with your podcast. We're going to talk about that in, in a minute. But before we get there, we want to mention we have a little thing we do at the top of the show when available called How I Save My Podcast. How I Save My Podcast is all about you telling us something that went wrong with your podcast. We want to know what went wrong and how did you fix it? The idea behind this is we can all share with each other that things sometimes do happen, not necessarily to our favor. And we can sometimes climb out from the rubble and restore our podcast, make it better, fix it, save our podcast. So we encourage you to send us those story. And we have a little bit of a uh, a question this week, right, SP? Yeah, this is late breaking news today. We got a tweet today, earlier today, and it was from the Why Do We Read This podcast. That's at Why Do We Read This on Twitter. And the lady sent a tweet. They said, at Better Pod. How about a, how do I say my podcast? I'm freaking out because I accidentally deleted the wrong Audacity data file and it's not in my trash. So I've been here before and I simply asked, did you save the original file? They came back with, yeah, but it was a mess because I renamed the file. Lesson learned. We were able to recover all but a couple of minutes eventually. Married a techie. So that helps. I just did voiceover for the lost section. So a few lessons learn here. Number one is always have a backup. Number two, never use the actual file that you have recorded in your uh, the, 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 the DAW to do editing on. You always save another copy to do editing on it so that the original file is still there if you need to do it. And then three... Yeah, do voiceover for the lost section if it's only a couple of minutes. Yes, I couldn't agree more, SP. Also, it's kind of a little bit fun when you do save your podcast by re-recording it because if you do it well and you line up the tone and the delivery, which sometimes takes many different takes, you know that it happened. Your audience doesn't know. And when you're listening, you're like, hee hee hee, that was me from another day. I usually giggle like that. Yes, that's true. It is a pain because you try to match the voice comber and the sound and everything. And especially if you're sick, like Steven, have fun replicating yourself, future Steven, because you're sick today. You're probably not going to be sick in a couple of days. That's hopefully the case. Let's go ahead, though, and move on to our featured segment. Over the past month or so, we've been noticing a lot of chat over in the Discord, over at betterpodcasting.com slash Discord, about podcasters trying to save time. There's been a lot of great conversation. 
And in the past, we've talked a little bit about some time-saving tips with episodes 114 and episode 205, but these were more generalities, just some general ideas that you could do to save yourself some time. Now, here's the thing. While we have in the past talked about some ways that you can save time, we've also never talked about the other side of the coin with those time-saving tips, how sometimes you still may have some manual labor and some manual intervention needed with these automation processes. And this is because in many cases, there is a level of groundwork that's needed to be laid with these different processes before you're able to use these time-saving tips. Additionally, sometimes these time-saving tips are things that will reduce time, but still have a level of manual intervention needed. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to give you both sides of the coin there, talk about some specific methods that SP and I use. Yeah, we're not generalizing here. We're using specific examples. What we do to make things easier as we podcast and do a little bit of live streaming too. Yeah, there's a little bit in there. But also some things that we have to do manually to do with these time-saving tips. Let's kick it off with some prep work, SP. We're going to talk about how we prepare for our show to make it easier to start off the segment. As we are recording this show from two different places, yes, this show, Better Podcasting, we have to depend on technology to help plan our show and guide us through the recording session. We can't stand there and whiteboard everything out together physically, and it's just part of podcasting when you have geographically separated individuals working together. So what we do for this show is we use Google Docs for the working notes for our show. And the way that we make this easier is we've created a template that we can simply clone each time to save it as a new file, throw the new episode number on as a title, and then go from there. It has the general show outline, for example, our main segment points, the better podcasting download, et cetera. It also has sections that we can put information in as needed like if we have an announcement or a how I save my podcast story, just slide it right in there. But while we have this right now, we had to do a lot of work to get to that point. If you take a look at our earlier show notes, Stephen, I don't know if you've gone pack back and looked at them. They're just atrocious compared to the finely tuned machine that we have now. First, we had to try out some different layouts before we found the one that worked best for us. But beyond that, it also kept evolving with time. For example, when we first added the How I Save My Podcast segment, we had to modify the template to have it in the same place every week. However, there are many other continued manual things that we have to do with the document. First, obviously, we have to populate with the content each week. This is discussion points the better podcasting download, copy and pasting feedback into the document so we have it there. But other things that we have to do manually with it include adding filling information such as the date, episode number, etc. We also have to organize this document manually. For example, we have this on Google Drive, but then we need to move it to an archive folder occasionally, not just one, but a bulk of them. We move over to an archive folder and we also have to manually name it And when we name our document, we actually include the recording date for our organizational purposes. Say like today, we're recording on a Friday. We usually record on a Tuesday. This is for our historical reference. And this is because sometimes we have multiple weeks documents simultaneously working. And when we do this, we have to manually do all the actions that we just talked about. The manual organization of the document does help us to refer to past content that we covered. For example, at the beginning of the show, Stephen mentioned that we covered time-saving tips in episodes 114 and 205. What do you bet that Stephen actually went back and searched our documents for time-saving tips? Stephen, did you do that? No, I used my time machine. That was the easier way. Well, that's the other, yeah, except for creating a time machine is not easy. But another big way that we make our prep easier is with our equipment and setup each week. I'll start us off. As we mentioned, we live stream this show through video. Now, I'm the one that actually does the streaming aspect, like the technical streaming aspect. And as such, what this means is I connect with SP through a session and then do a bunch of things to make this streaming happen on my end. Now, while there's all sorts of technical fine details that I could share to do with this, 
I'm going to just share one that share one that's I think is probably most applicable to people listening or watching this show. And this is all to do with me having to set up the live stream details each week. So I have to go and set up the details each week for the live stream. I don't want to get into all the specific ins and outs of the streaming process. I just want to generalize a little bit here. This means that what I have to do is manually input an episode title to go out to the broadcast and make sure that it's streaming to various locations because we do stream this to multiple locations. One of the ways that I've made this process easier is by using a service called Restream. It's essentially a service that I send one feed to, it goes and sends it out to a bunch of different places. And what's nice about that is there's an ability for me to go and set this information, this title, just with one click. So I put in the, the keystrokes, hit update, and it updates all of these different locations. Makes things quite a bit easier. But the other side of the coin here is I, we also stream this over on Geeks.Live somewhere that I have to manually update as well. So I have to go and I have to find the YouTube URL. I have to put it over there and also update that page manually because it's a secondary piece. So there's still manual work in there, but I've saved my time using Restream. And another thing that I want to just quickly touch on here, because I do know we have some people who do video things, is I make my live video aspect a lot easier by using a couple of different tools. Number one, I have a backdrop that is full of different colors and I have different lights and it's usually a den when I'm not podcasting, but then the lights change. Well, I use smart lighting to help so that I just have to essentially give one command to my voice assistant and it changes it all. And the other thing that I do as well is I use something called a stream deck, which ends up making the live video production a little bit easier so that I just have some hot keys to push rather than end up having to go in and pull up my window every single week in order to pull up or every single time I want to push a key. Don't have to do that. I just push a single button on a physical stream deck. But there was manual work that was needed with both of these things as well. I had to go and first configure all of my different lighting, find what looked good, find out the settings, and then go into my smart routines and program that. And then with the Stream Deck as well, I had to go and program all of that stuff up front as well. And sometimes maintain that. Like if we have a guest on at the show, I have to go and add them there. So there's manual work needed for both of these things. Now I could also talk a little bit about my audio setup, but I will defer to SP for that as well. Before I get to the audio setup, I'll just say that when I stream Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is a video and audio streamed recording, it takes me about an hour to set up everything. So as much as everything has been streamlined to do automation and do program, so I don't have to do a lot of stuff, it's a lot of work on the forefront of setting everything up. So it's about an hour before we go ahead and stream. And that is with using templates all the way in the future. So we're going to talk about the audio side of things. And this is if you're streaming live or not. First and foremost, I feel like I am a little bit old school now because there's a lot more digital tools and hardware tools that might make a little bit of this easier more simplistic, or at least a lot less gear on my desk. But this is what I use. And if you started podcasting a couple of years ago, this was kind of the best gear available to go ahead and do what we do. I use a Zoom H6 as my main audio recorder. I do multi-track recording through it. So I record myself on one track. I re record my soundboard on one track. And then I record everything that's coming in on a third track. So I'm at least using three tracks every single time and I'm isolating at least three things every single time. This also means though, since I'm using the H6, I have to push the record button. If I don't push the record button, nothing gets recorded, and I have to go to one of the lesser quality backups I have. I also have to ensure before we start that the SD card has enough memory on it to record the two to three hours of the show prior to starting. I actually have to check how much space is left on the SD card. And yes, about three hours is the minimum that I have on an SD card before I press record, because I never know 
when there's just going to be audio gold and might go over that two hour mark. And most of the shows that we do are around an hour, but I start recording the moment that I connect with my co-hosts on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. And we did the same thing on Starling Tribune. So you just never know when that pre and post show plus the show is going to go over two hours. So always make sure I have three hours of recording space. Finally, post recording, I usually literally take the SD card out of the H6, plug it into my computer's SD slot, and copy and save the files onto my podcast production computer. That is work, manual work that I have to do. This process might be tedious, but it also has a benefit, and I have backup files, and those backup files have saved me a few times. So I'm happy to have the backup. Now, what am I talking about backups? As long as I take that SD card out, put it in my computer and copy, not move, but copy those files and then place them on my podcast computer to go ahead and insert into the DAW, I now have created two versions of the file. So I've automatically have a backup. There's only one version of the file until I copy and paste it into my files, but that is the SD card. I also have backup recordings and yes, they are lesser audio quality for various reasons we can get into on another podcast, but at least I have something. And yes, having to take that SD card out of the H6, put it into the computer has saved my show a few times. So there's a few shortcuts that I use in this process. I've constructed a tower and it sits behind my monitor and it has the H6 permanently mounted on it which also helps with cord management. So I have a bunch of cords going into that. Remember, I mentioned that I am recording multiple tracks. I actually have six different audio cords in there for different audio paths already. It's already set to go, but having six XLR cords going into that small H6 means it has to undergo some sort of cord management. Otherwise, it's just spaghetti all over the place. So having that mounted on the tower helps with cord management, and it also helps that I can view it and I can see it's actually recording. I see the red numbers on top that's saying it's recording, and I'm also looking at the audio volume gauges or gain gauges saying that there is something that is being recorded on the specific channel. I also use an H6 remote, and I have the record and stop button literally right next to my fingertips on the keyboard on my desk. So being able to have that clearly in my eyesight, being able to have the start and stop button clearly right by where my right hand is every week, every time I record, it's been a time saver. So I don't have to get up on my chair, reach over everything and press the record button on the H6. These are time saving tips, having your setup organized in a way that you can quickly get to everything and have it the same every time. More on that later. Secondly, having a common share file or file sharing system prior to recording the episode to share the recording files with your co-hosts is a great help. This is if everybody does a local recording. I know not everybody does this. Usually the best thing that you want to do if you have regular co-hosts is everybody records on their own end, even if it's with Audacity, you know, whatever recording program that you actually use, have everybody record a backup at their end. Make sure that you have a common place to put those files so that everybody just knows where to go. For example, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., Michelle does a document about a day before we record. She places the OneDrive folder link in those show notes the day prior to where we record. So afterwards, we can just all throw our files in there and then whoever is editing can go ahead and pick up those files and just go whenever they want to. Everybody just knows to do this. When we stop recording, everybody throws their files over there. And we've been going for a few years, so it's just routine and habit now. But you might have to remind your co-hosts if you're new. The producer of or the VA or whoever is actually editing knows where to go get the files every single time. We did the same thing with Starling Tribune and our virtual assistant or VA. Heather never had to guess where the files were. We just told her the files were up. She went and grabbed them and then went ahead to editing. I will go ahead with another couple of time saving tips that provide some setup prior to recording. I bought a microphone arm 
and having my microphone permanently mounted in place drastically reduces setup time. And I know not everybody can do this. Not everybody can dedicate a space for podcasting. But if you have dedicated a space for podcasting, if you can permanently mount your equipment, you're going to save some time. For me, I had to construct a unique way to permanently mount my microphone. It starts with a wall shelf, which is anchored to the wall by heavy anchors. No, we're not talking about like Navy anchors or sea anchors or anything like that. You know, anchors away, my boy, anchors away. No, none of that Navy stuff. Yeah, of course. You're talking about the podcasting service anchor. No, I'm I'm also not talking about anchor of the service. What oh. I'm talking about is those really robust wall anchors. And there's a reason because there's a lot of torque and weight on it. I used a desktop mount 12 inch riser, which is actually screwed into that shelf. I've used a professional level boom arm. It's the Heil PL2T. I've used it since 2014. I haven't had to replace it yet. It's held up well. I know eventually I will have to replace it. There's also a channel for a microphone cord through that boom arm, so I don't have to worry about it getting caught anywhere. I've used a tabletop stand extension at the end of the boom arm. I mean, this boom arm is stretched as, as long as it actually can be. And I'm using a three inch sure extension for the mic flag. So there's a place for the mic flag. And I can clearly say like on this show, better podcasting. If I'm on Guinea Geeks, the Guinea Geeks show. And if I'm on Legends of Shield, it's the Legends of Shield logo that's sitting up there. Every week, I just pull the microphone in and turn on the preamp and it's ready to go. And after I'm done, I just push it away. But that was a lot of prep that I had to do to get to the point where I could just pull the microphone in, turn it on and be ready to go. Finally, what I did is I installed a rack mounted power switcher, which allows me to turn off and on systems that I want. We're talking about preamps, my compressor, my mixer, the speakers. Yes, I don't want the speakers on when I'm recording, so they are off. The lights, the, my actual podcasting lights, and all I have to do is reach over and turn the switches on and off. Now, I will tell you that there are two switches on there that I don't want to turn off when I'm podcasting, and I have before. They are the switches for my modem and for my router. And what I've done to mitigate that is I put in marine safety switches there so I can clearly feel that they are different switches. And Steven right now is shaking his head at me because he remembers the Gunna Geek show that I literally turned them off mid show. And I was just trying to show that I could turn off and on my lights. And this is before smart switches, by the way. And it, yeah, I took me a good 15, 20 minutes to get rebooted up because it was before the day of SSDs and quick boots up and the router modem took forever to recycle too. So yeah, these are all time-saving tips that I have done to just be able to sit down and podcast and record. I could do it in like 15 seconds or less really. So I am grateful that I've done all this, but it was a lot of work to set up to get to this point. But since I podcast three to four times a week, I can just sit down, rip it and grip it and go. And when you are ready to go, you're going to start recording your show, which is the next category of tips that we have. And let's kick it all off here talking about a little bit about the way that we have made it easier for ourselves to record our podcast. And this has a lot to do with some of that equipment that SP just mentioned a second ago, is we have made our recording process easier by creating a clean signal chain for our recording. Now, one of the biggest ways that we did this was by using a DBX286 audio processor. We both do this. This adds a little bit of noise removal by using the gating function, adds a little bit of compression and a little bit of mild EQ more or less. But here's the thing. While you'll find all sorts of podcast advice givers recommending the DBX286, what you might not hear commonly talked about is that it's not so easy to set up. It's not you take it out of the box and you're off to the races. This is because all of these different functions, while there are not many, do end up adding up to a whole plethora of different possible sound. And so you have to take some time to dial these all in and find the right balance for your voice, equipment, and just general personal preference. In fact, this varies so much that every time SP and I use a new microphone, 
it takes us forever to find what we feel are the optimal settings on the DBX286 for our voice with that microphone for the desired sound that we have. This is something that we, every single week or every single episode we record, end up making a change if we do start using a new microphone to try out. This is a lot of manual work that is done up front and sometimes ongoing. But once you get there, it's a lot easier because it saves you some other things down the road. And definitely, we're big advocates of the DBX286, but it's not pull it out of the box and go. It takes time to find the right sound. The DBS-286S is not the only bit of hardware that we use, and it's not the only bit of hardware that you can use for those functions that Stephen was mentioning. However, it is by far the least expensive of the options. I mean, there's a lot of digital stuff out there, but it's all more expensive. So it just depends on what you want to do, ease versus expense. Some of the other hardware that has helped at least me later in editing are things like pop filters and windscreens. Plosives take time to take out of your recording or it takes money with a good plugin. And I haven't found a good plugin yet that will take just the plosives out of your recording and not affect everything else. And a pop filter can definitely help reduce that editing time. You don't have to go in and take out like the lower end base of every time that somebody says a P or a B or a T or C, something like that. That happens from time to time. I have a couple of co-hosts that they just get out of whack and they get into their microphone at a certain angle or get too close or they get too excited. And then all of a sudden the next five, 10, 15 minutes is just a bunch of plosives. Every time they say P I've got to go in there and reduce the bass on that, which is basically the air puff that's going over the microphone. So say anything under like 150 megahertz or something like that, I have to take out and it reduces the the pop. So if you're in your car listening to your podcast and you've got the you know car with a good bass system on it or something, your ears aren't blown out every time that somebody says a P. So having a pop filter and a windscreen can help mitigate it. It's not going to completely reduce it, but it's going to help mitigate it. Another thing that has helped me in editing is monitor what you're recording real time. I am wearing headphones now, and Stephen are generally wearing in-ear monitors, so we're both monitoring our sound when we record. I don't have my headphones plugged into my computer or my mixer. They're plugged in directly to the Zoom H6, which is what is actually being recorded. This helps me isolate audio artifacts. Haley, for example, on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. a couple of months ago started developing some audio chain issues. Instead of actually going ahead with the terrible audio, we mitigated it by having her switch in the stream to her webcam mic. And that is a workaround for now. It meant that it was at least listenable for everybody that was listening to the live stream. And her recording is still the good audio that's being recorded on her Zoom H5. But had I not been actually monitoring the recording from my Zoom H6, I might not have heard that. And I would have been extremely frustrated with a file that I thought I couldn't release after the fact, just because of all of the hiss and audio artifacts that were coming out of there. It's not ideal, but it actually worked. And it worked because I was monitoring the real-time recording from my Zoom H6. If you don't have a way to monitor the actual recording, then you should look for a way to monitor the actual recording. Now, you were just talking about some of the ways that you can make things easier in recording to make your life easier with editing. But how about when you get to that actual editing process? Yes, we have some tips for saving time during the editing process. We're big advocates of editing your podcast. First thing that we want to mention right now is very similar to one of the first things we mentioned this episode, which is using a template for editing. Essentially, we've set up a way that in our editor, we have a session that we can go and duplicate each week that has a bunch of things that are pre-done for us. For example, we both use Magic's Vegas Movie Studio in the process, and in there, you can add a bunch of audio effects to each person's track, like EQ and other things. So instead of having to go in and apply those each individually to each person each episode, we have a template set up that they all have these effects on there. So we're just copying the template 
When we open up the template, oh, look, everything's good to go. There's a bunch of other benefits in there as well because of the fact that it has all of our sounds preloaded that we might use, like the bumpers and the stingers, the pre-rolls, all this other stuff, and just a general familiarity, the way that every track laid out so that we're, each week we're editing with, say, SP as track one, me as track two. Actually, I'm usually track bottom because let's be honest, even the the music bumpers and stingers are more important than me. So we are using the same process each week. And again, that just helps with making things easier as you edit. But it took manual work to get there because of the fact that we had to set up these templates. We had to figure out what was going to work and we had to make sure that that was applied in there. And sometimes we have to make changes. For example, we may have to go in and change the compression for somebody if they have changed their mic setup each week, every single episode that I do, I go and I take a look at the compression that we are adding to our individual tracks for this show, because sometimes something might change and I want to make sure that I'm using a certain amount of compression, relatively speaking. And so if all of a sudden SP on his end goes and turns up the gain on his microphone, I need to go in and manually reduce that on the audio track so that he sounds sort of the same level of compressed each week rather than sounding over compressed or not compressed enough. So there is manual work that was needed to set that up, but also manual work that needs to be done ever going. And that includes if say again, we have a guest on here. Now I got to go and set them up a track and find out what works best for them. So it's not automated all the time, but it saves a heck of a lot of steps. And even though I have the template in Movie Studio, I go in and make sure that I'm input, inserting the correct compression levels on Gmax because otherwise I either blow it out or it's just not going to be loud enough in comparison to the other tracks. So that's manual work that I do every week. However, I will say I do it by sight. I will see how big those waveforms are and I automatically I just say, okay, I've been doing this for a while and I can say, okay, that's going to be 6 dB again, 9 dB again, 24 dB again. I already know just by looking at the track how much gain I need to throw in there to equalize everything. So that comes with experience, but I still have to go in every week and make sure that those levels are set. Otherwise, the file that I'm going to render out of Movie Studio is not going to be great. Another way that we help ourselves is by using keyboard shortcuts and hotkeys. Using keyboard shortcuts instead of a mouse can be a way to make things happen in a faster manual. For example, deleting a section, switching editing tool, etc. I'll give you three right off the bat that just saved me an immense amount of time. First of all, when I'm in Movie Studio, I use M, marker, and that sets the specific point that I have to throw in the bumpers, the video bumpers, the audio bumpers, and where the audio starts and stops. Using that M key for the marker really helps my editing speed and really smooths that flow. So that's one. I'm going to move on to, into Audacity. I use Control L for silence. That has saved me so much time. And then Control I to actually cut the track so I can move it around. I can move it and slice it and dice it. Those are three that I use all the time. Steven, do you have one just off the tip of your hat that you would like to share with the crowd? I do. Uh, if you go into actually, it's universal. If you go in to your editor and you type in control delete SJ, it will delete Steven <laughs> from all of the podcast. It's pretty amazing. I see. <laughs> well, well, so, sometimes this could be enhanced further by using hotkeys or macros, essentially a command that allows a series of action to happen, just like Steven was talking about. In both of these scenarios, there is manual intervention that is needed along the way. With simple keyboard commands, there needs to be research that is done to figure out what the commands are. This could be a matter of using a manual, looking up a video, etc. However, as keyboard commands are plentiful, there also may need to be something set up to help remember these at first. For example, creating a note that you can reference as you get to remember which keyboard command does what. We've definitely done this when using a new program. As for the hotkeys or macros, this will vary depending on the method. You may have to set it up within your editing software. It could be a piece of software to do with the keyboard. And Steven's got an example, and so do I. So Steven, why don't you start? 
Sure. Uh, one of the ways that I make my editing easier um, is the fact that I use a Logitech keyboard. It's a Logitech, Logitech G105 keyboard, and it has a series of uh, programmable keys on the left side where I can go in and I can assign them a command. And so that's what I've done is I've gone in and I've put them put a keyboard shortcut in there. For example, one of them is simple. Bottom one is control S because I like to save regularly. So just by tapping my bottom key, bottom left key, my project is saving. I do it all the time. Pretty much any time I, uh, I make a change, I just hit that. It's just become a habit. So it saved me a ton of time because I'm saving regularly just by getting in the habit of just flicking that key. Another one that I do as well is that in Magic's Vegas Movie Studio, to delete a big section of time, essentially taking a, a big uh, like gap, for example, maybe I've taken out a big discussion point. In order to collapse all of that information, it's a series of keyboard commands that are needed. I'd have to look it up right now to see what those are because I don't use those commands anymore because all I did was program one key that it goes and it does these series of keyboard commands. And it's really, really cumbersome in uh, Vegas Movie Studio to delete a section and collapse it. It is a series of commands. So those are a couple examples on how I do it. And then some of the other ones are just switching tools. So like one of them will be switching to the cut tool or to the selection tool. Uh, and I've just programmed those in there. So again, I'm just pushing one key rather than having to push a couple keys in it to use the keyboard shortcut. So it saved quite a bit of time. And also, I no longer have to remember these keyboard commands anymore. But I had to set those up originally because you have to go into the Logitech setup, the software, and enter those in and program those. And then the other aspect of that is you want to go and export those so that if you end up having to reinstall the software or reinstall your computer, you can re-import those. So there was manual work that was needed. And I might eventually start using the Stream Deck for this as well, but it's the same idea. In Audacity, I learned very early on, I used Truncate Silence for the audio version of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. And I learned very early on that in the version of Audacity that I use, I didn't have a shortcut key for that. So I created one. I created it by going into Edit Preferences. It brings up a menu of different things that you can look at. You can actually go into Keyboard in the Preferences, and you can create your own shortcut keys to actually do this. And what I did is for truncate silence, I chose alt T. So in my version of audacity, whenever I click alt T, then it truncates silence automatically. And I don't have to worry about going through the menu options and looking at it through the mouse short keys. In my opinion, having using pad programs for my entire career, having using now the audio and video editing software, over the last four or five years, this is definitely the short keys or hot keys or the series of commands that you can program in. It will save you so much time. So if there is an action that you need to program in, there is always a way to throw that in in a macro or a hot key or shortcut key. Experience what that is for your software that you're using, and it will save so much time as you edit every week. We also want to mention in regards to saving time, encoding the MP3. Now, we've discussed quite heavily on this before, but we'll just snapshot it right now. We both use software that allows us to copy and paste MP3 ID3 tags from a previous episode and add them into our new MP3. It saves so much time for me, Steve, and especially in that publishing set where you've rendered the file, you're just trying to get it out, and you don't want to spend a lot of time posting everything. This is a key area that just saves so much time and aggravation. Absolutely. Uh, I have been so happy since I started using this because I used to do it all in iTunes and it was a pain in the butt, even though I was copying and pasting. This was nice just to copy the whole file and most of those tags are there. But the thing is, this isn't always an automated process because again, number one, we had to set that up originally. What is the format that we want every single episode that we publish? But the other side of things is that sometimes things do need to be changed in there. For example, the title. The title needs to be changed every single time. So does the description. 
as well as the episode number. But sometimes there's things that do change once a year that you need to now remember to change like the year. So there are things that are manually changed, but it's nice because the rest of it is automated. Now, the last thing that we want to mention right now to do with publishing and promoting is copying and pasting a lot of information in other uses as well. For example, when we post this show, Better Podcasting, we have to post it to Libsyn, to gunageek to betterpodcasting.com. And that's a lot of keystrokes unless you copy paste. So the way I do it is I go in and I start creating it in one of these places. Honestly, I'll pick one at random. I cre- create the notes in one place and then start copying and pasting from that to the other locations. It saves a ton of time, but again, there is some manual work needed because not all of them use all of the same formats. For example, we have all of our show notes, the things that we reference on betterpodcasting.com, but we don't have them on Libsyn. So if, say, I pull up Libsyn and I start typing in there, then I have to go paste that over to betterpodcasting.com and then start adding other notes below that the manual uh, typing of the links that we've talked about, et cetera. When I start my show notes for the post for Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., what I do is I go to a different program which has a template in it. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be Microsoft Word. It could be Notepad. It could be Google Docs. could be whatever you use on a Mac. It doesn't matter as long as you're starting the show notes there. Now, I know that there's extra characters and programs like Microsoft Word that you have to be wary of as you're copying and pasting it over. So you might want to go to a pure text editor and on Windows Notepad is a good example. There are differences and there are detriments to using Notepad because it's not a a full text editor, but use something and have a template out there. And then you can go ahead and copy and paste into everything. Sure, you're going to be changes like Steven mentioned, but if you don't start in any of them, you can make the show notes that are universal and then you can just pick what you need and then throw it into whatever system you're doing. Like he was talking about Le- Legends of Shield, for example. Let's take that. I post that on Libsyn. I post that on Gunna Geek. I also do a weekly Reddit post in the subreddits that have podcasting in there. So all of those have different formats to them, and I keep all those formats in the core template. These can always be reused as well. In the episode post for the content, as I'm listening while I'm editing, I actually have a place in the template to write down the posts I need to add in into the episode description. Now, a lot of people do this differently. A lot of people know what they want to say and they just write it out there. I don't. So I make sure I listen to the episode of actually what was said and write those down in the episode description. You can also know use the episode show notes as a source for this. I've done that as well. And having that table in the show note template to write down those ideas as I'm editing definitely helps complete the post later. If I didn't have that I would have to go back and listen to it again for all the points. And I'm just OCD like that. So I would have to do it and it saves so much time just to do it while I'm editing. And it definitely saves time, but I had to take the time to set up the template with the spot in the template to write down all of these things in a table so I could switch them around if I need to and have that available as I'm writing that paragraph that begins off the show notes every week on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. In closing, we're big advocates of using tools and techniques and methods that save yourself time. After all, you're a hobby podcaster. You're not making money off of this. You are someone who is spending your time towards your craft. But it's important to remember that as much as you automate, there's still going to be manual intervention that is needed. This is why we really do highlight the importance of time considerations when you're thinking about launching a podcast or launching a new podcast. It's important that you consider ways that you can save yourself time to make this happen, but also consider the other side of things. What are the manual aspects that you are going to have to do every week? And when you're sitting there and you committed to getting the episode out by Sunday evening and it's 12 at night, 
and you know that SP is going to get mad if you don't get it out, are you still okay with the fact that you have to go in and type the darn stupid episode number in the ID3? Sorry. Uh, summary, make sure you're okay with all of the manual interventions that you'll have to do in all of the processes. To that, all I have to say, Stephen, is you lobbied and asked to be the one that actually posts most of the episodes. So that's on you, buddy. You're the one that took that on. Let's download. All right. This is the Better Podcasting Download. I'll be honest with you. This week has been incredibly busy for me. And usually I try to take time off to listen to the Edison research, the infinite dial this week, I could not take that time to do it. And I couldn't even take the time to actually watch the replay after the fact. But what I did is I went in and I saw their slides and I perused through the slides. This is a study that is done every year now and has been for the last like 20 years or so. I forget what the first year was that it came out, but it is billed as the longest running survey of digital media consumer behavior in America. It has been going on since 1998. So I just answered my own question right there. We're talking about 22 years here. Not all of them, of course, have had podcasting in there because podcasting didn't start until 2004 and these uh, infinite dial didn't include podcasting until a few years later. Now, the Infinite Dial does track mobile behaviors, internet audio podcasting, internet audio podcasting, social media, smart speakers, and much, much more. The study methodology is that in January or February every year, and this is 2020, Edison Research conducts a national telephone, telephone survey. This year, it was with 1,502 people aged 12 years old and older. And they use a random digit dialing technique to both cell phones and landlines. The survey was offered in both English and Spanish, and the data weighted to national 12 plus U.S. population figures. So you're talking about people that are 12 years old or over, which is what I would think you'd be interested in with podcasting to begin with. Now, we're not going to talk about the entire survey. It's 70 plus slides of information and a wonderful presentation that the guys do every year. But what we're going to do is we're going to focus specifically on podcasting because that's what we're talking about here is podcasting, more specifically hobby podcasting. So the first thing that caught my eye was audio sources currently ever used in a car and the verbiage on this stuff, you just have to get used to it. So what we're talking about is anybody who's aged 18 and over who has driven or ridden in a car in the last month which was in this case, 89% of that 1500 people that were contacted. And they had podcasts on there from 2018 through 2020. So we're talking about the percentage of people that answered the survey that have used audio sources in a car. The different ones were AM, FM radio, uh, the digital music that you own, a CD player. Yes, CD players are still pretty huge here. Online radio, podcasts, and Sirius XM. Just with the podcasts alone, in 2018, you had 23% of the respondents say they have ever listened to a podcast in a car. In 2019, that went up to 26%. And in 2020, that's 28%. So this is not accounting for people not knowing what a podcast was. You know, Maybe previously they listened to a podcast in the car and they just didn't know about it. it sounded like talk radio to them or something like that. But this is them knowingly listening to a podcast in a car. It's still showing an increase. And I think especially when you're talking about CarPlay, Apple CarPlay, and uh, what is it? Google Car. I forget what the Google version is. Google Auto. Android Auto. Android Auto. Because you have that and people are just streaming them directly from their phone, I think you're just going to see this go up and up over time. And I want to put some context to this. This is the aspect that I thought was pretty interesting. Because when you, when you think about that at first, you're like, ah, 23% versus 28, eh, whatever. Um, I think it's important to think about that percentage difference from the perspective of how a CD player declined. The results in this showed a CD player declined from 49% in 2018 down to 41%. In 2020. And when you think about a CD player, think about how many people you know no longer use CD players and how much you are just throwing CD players 
to the waste bin, right? Like, think about it. Think about that. And so you, that gives you a context to that decline, 49 to 41. That's only 8% 8, 8 different. And we're going from 23 to 28. That's, that is almost comparable. And I thought that that was pretty interesting. The AM FM radio, I think, is high for now for me. I don't know. Maybe I was just an earlier adopter. I rarely listen to the radio in a car. Yes, have I listened to radio in the past month in the car? Yes, but I've had other people in my car, which I normally haven't had other people in the car, and I just generally turn on a radio station when that happens. So in this past month, it's a bad example, but over the past year, I've only listened to podcasts and it has declined from 2018 from 82% to 2020 in the 81%, so 1% drop. I am going to look at that and see in the future years how much that actually drops over the next few years. Because between streaming radio and podcasts and you know your own owned audiobooks or whatever, I just see that going down. Although it appears that people are still listening to the radio, so we'll go with that. Let's move on to podcasting familiarity in a no duh move from 2006, which I believe was the first year that this study included podcasting. Podcasting familiarity was at 22% of the respondents. In 2020, it has moved up to 75% of the respondents. It has gone up almost every single year. And I think that's no duh because you do have podcasts being referred to in TV and movies. You have the big houses like CNN and ESPN and, and uh, everybody else have podcasts. So I think you're going to see that get to 100% sooner or later. It's just going to take a little bit more time. But 75% is almost a commanding acknowledgement that podcasting is here. And by the way, Stephen, I know they do a separate Canadian survey, but this is just the United States. So this does not account for our other Northern American English speaking country. And Stephen has just left the building. Oh, no. America. Wow. American flags. Okay. I really didn't send those to Stephen. He picked those up on his last trip to America. So in moving on, we're dealing with the percent that has ever listened to a podcast. And in 2006, that was 11%. In 2020, it was 55%. So that's growing almost every year and is getting more and more mainstream. In the last month, the percentage that has listened to a podcast has risen from 9% in 2008 to 37% in 2020. And more importantly, in the weekly category, the percent has risen from 7% in 2013 to 24% in 2020. So definitely pe more people listen on a monthly basis than on a weekly basis, but you do have people that listen on a weekly basis. There is also, a question here that they asked about the average time spent listening to podcasts. This is in hours and minutes, and it's over the last week. So in 2015, this was, I believe, the first year that they took this stat. It was four hours and 27 minutes. It goes up and down, but ultimately it rises to the most ever this year in 2020 to six hours and 39 minutes. So of those people that do listen to podcasts, they listen to over six hours, almost seven hours every week. Steven, you count yourself around the six hour mark for that? I, I would think that I'd be around um, probably pretty close to that because of the fact that I do listen on my commutes all the time. And um, I listen at home sometimes as well. But I think I'd be around that. Um, I, I don't think I would be much more than that, if I'm being honest. Yeah, so there's definitely a limit. I don't think this will keep on rising forever. I think you're going to just see the available time that people have on average to listen to podcasts. And I think it's going to be somewhere around the four to eight hour mark. If we settle on seven hours, I wouldn't be surprised eventually. But yeah, I think that you're just going to get to a point where people have other things going on in their lives and they're not going to be listening to more than a certain amount every week. You know, there is one thing that's going to drive this higher, and this is probably the biggest takeaway from, from this average listening, is you better get in on things now because SP, he's up in his 80s, and so pretty soon he's going to be retiring. When I think 84 is his goal. And so when he hits 84 and he retires, uh, so just a couple years away, he's going to be doing podcasts nonstop. He's going to record and release three per day 
And and that's going to be like, people are going to go, I need to listen to all this SP content. And it's going to be like 30 hours a week that people are listening to podcasts. So get in now. Well, not quite. So that stat, so six hours and 39 minutes average per week, coupled with the next stat that we've talked about for the last few years, it's the average number of podcasts a person listens to that listens to podcasts. And it's got everything from one to 11 or more. And they're saying here the average, and I haven't looked at the raw data, but they're saying that the average of people that listen to podcasts listen to six podcasts in the last week. So six hours, 39 minutes, the average person listens to six podcasts in a week that listens to podcasts. That's all good news. However, I just want to point out for the hobby podcaster out there, there's a lot of competition for podcasts. Soon there's going to be a million if there already isn't a million podcasts in Apple Podcasts. There's competition to be one of those six podcasts or one hour out of that six hours, 39 minutes. You got to make the best show that you can make in order to work your way into somebody's regular routine. And you are competing with the big boys out there and and even the independents that have been out there for a while, like Tom Merritt. I mean, you have to compete with that. If you're doing a tech podcast, you got to compete with that stuff. So. You just need to make the best podcast that you can make. You're going to have to do some advertisements to get noticed in the million podcasts are out there. And that's the competition to be one of those six podcasts, at least in the past year, six podcasts in the United States or six hours of listening time every week. That's that's some tough competition. It's not impossible. I'm just saying I'm setting realistic expectations. You got to be one of that to somebody who's out there looking for a podcast. This is where we here at Better Podcasting turn the show over to you as we run through some of your feedback. We call this segment Better Podback. We got just a couple of things we want to touch on today in the Better Podback. Uh, First, we had a question come in through our Discord and it said, question for Steven and SP. Love the episode about testing different mics to hear their sound. But how does one do this in a budget-friendly manner? It's not exactly like I can go out and buy all these mics even used to see which one sounds the best. And there's no way to test them in Guitar Center or similar stores since the atmosphere is not applicable to real recording conditions. Any suggestions? And we had Yakko.org actually respond to that and said, there is MicRentals.com, but I haven't used them. So you could definitely uh, use mic rentals, but the, the problem is that you, you don't really have a good way to test them affordably um, unless you use something like that or you can borrow one from somebody. And so that's why we're kind of saying in that last episode, you kind of got to make an educated best guess. And we really encourage you to go find shootouts, find a variety of different samples and see if you can find someone that you think has a similar sounding voice to you. Um, ideally, you get your wonderful co-host from Marca to send you one to test out. Uh, and then you hold on to it forever. We've been blessed on this show to be able to do that. We've both searched for microphones in the price range that we wanted to, and we're able to test several microphones out and to get the best sound for our voice. And I realize not everybody can do it. We did it because we wanted to share what we found with everybody. I know there's other people out there like Bandrew Scott over on podcasting. She's got a lot of great YouTubes. The one thing that even Bandrew admits to is he is one person with one style of voice testing everything. He has tested different setups, but he usually goes to the whatever it is, Scarlet 2i2 he used for several years as the staple to test the microphones out with. But, uh, You know, you just got to go with your gut feeling in some cases. And if you can't rent them, I go ahead and rent them. It is going to be expensive, but it's not going to be as expensive as buying them. So there you go there. We also had a note from Dave Klein from Podchaser step in and said, hey, guys, Steph invited me in. Happy to talk about anything. So that was an unexpected pleasure brought to us by Steph Fuscio. Damien responded to that and he just said, I'll just skip heating around the bush. The conversation that led to you being invited here was curiosity over the Podchaser Twitter dropping all of their follows. You don't have to say why, but the theories and discussion around that happening is what was going on. Aha. Dave from Podchaser 
actually responded to this. And apparently it was just this big thing going on. He said, oh gosh, the follows. So that whole thing came about because we were following a massive amount of accounts and not all of them were podcasts or podcasters. Felt like we were collecting rather than showcasing. So the idea was to use Twitter follows as a new avenue to shine the spotlight on a podcast and its creators, i.e. follow people every day and make a specific post about it rather than amplify rather than collect. If we follow somebody among 10,000 other followers, that does not help anyone. So really just came from a place where we wanted to have a feature where we could bring more focused attention. It's why we started doing the must listen lists and trying to showcase more reviews. There has definitely been some negative reaction and I hate that completely did not predict that people would take it as us removing our support or turning our backs. But I totally get that is how it was appeared. We're obviously huge indie podcast fans, so I feel terrible about that. I still believe this is a great way to find another way to shine light on awesome creators. But the handling of it was poor, where we thought that mystery would have ramped up the excited of the spotlight. It turns out that the lack of communication was a mistake. So I get, Stephen, what they're going for here. They actually wanted to help spotlight podcasters. And when you have 10,000, 20,000 accounts that you follow, you can't really do that as well. But them just uniformly dropping all of their follows, it's like, oh, you don't like me anymore, that sort of thing. And, and I get that from a podcaster, how you would feel that way. I feel that way every time you follow me and then unfollow me. Is you just do it and you wait till I notice and then you unfollow me. When have I followed you? That's true. Uh, <laughs> the last thing we want to mention right now is something that I mentioned in the Discord. And so this is the sort of stuff that you miss out on when you're not in our Discord. And it was a post about a thing called live caption. I was at work taking a listen to a stream and I adjusted the volume on my Google Pixel 2. And I saw a new icon and I went, what's this icon? So I pushed the icon and it turned out it was a thing called live caption. Essentially in Android for many devices, they have now baked in a thing called live caption where it detects speech and media and then on the fly generates caption. So this does use extra battery, but I tried this out using some podcasts, using a couple streaming uh, radio services. And it was overall pretty good. Yes, there was a couple of uh, mistypes and things like that. But I thought this was fantastic for on the fly reading captioning. And I thought this might be really handy for someone who is listening to a podcast, say on a bus or something like that. Probably won't have crowded buses for a while. But when we are all back to having them again, they're really hard sometimes to hear the nuances in podcasts when you are listening. and so. Turning this on will give you a little bit of a caption where if you miss something, you might be able to refer to it. And there's no generation of subtitles or generation of transcripts that you're needing to manually do. This is something where the listener might have this ability. So if you listen to podcasts and you've got your phone near you and it's something that you think might be handy, take a look to see if you have this live caption function available on Android. Uh, I, again, I was pretty impressed with what I was seeing. So I wanted to mention it right now. And yeah, we had a bit of a chat about that. So head over to our Discord at betterpodcasting.com slash Discord. Now, before we go, SP, let's turn it over to you. You mentioned this in our live stream last week, but you, you deserve to promote it in the true show, the Better Podcasting episode 221, or should I say Sire? Because I feel like you're royalty now. I believe it's your majesty that you should use. Oh, fair enough. In all seriousness, I had the honor of being invited onto a podcast called The Pod Lords by Jim Harold. Jim harold has been podcasting since I believe 2005. He's one of the OG, I consider first generation OG podcasters out there. He created a podcast about podcasting called Pod Lords. I was on the 32nd episode of that, which you can find at podlords.com. And it was just a blast talking to Jim. Now, Jim is an independent professional podcaster. He's actually a stay-at-home podcaster. He does many shows a week, but he did want to have me on to talk about the hobbyist standpoint. 
we actually went back and forth between them and it wasn't a debate. We were just talking about the pros and cons of hobbyists and professional podcasting and, and independent podcasting as well. And our concerns with the space in general from all of those perspectives. So if you want to check that out, go to podlords.com. It is episode number 32. And I just want to thank Jim again very much for having me on. And Stephen, we did mention at the beginning of the show that he did mention at the beginning of the show that he's looking forward to having you on sometime in the future. And I look forward to hearing that episode when it actually airs. Well, congratulations on this, SB. Uh, you truly did a remarkable job and you deserve to be on there. And uh, yeah, pat yourself on the back. And I know a lot of people have really enjoyed this. So great job. And thanks for representing Better Podcasting on both of our behalf. Much, much appreciated. And again, Pod Lords, check that out. But that's going to go ahead and wrap it up for episode 221 of Better Podcasting. If you want to come have a little bit of just general chat, geek chat, podcast chat, come to betterpodcasting.com slash discord because we do have a bunch of other chat rooms there because this is part of the Gonna Geek Discord. So we have TV talk. We have uh, sci-fi talk. We have drone talk. We have just general talk. And I know right now a lot of people are looking for just general places to communicate with others digitally. And we would love to have you over there. If you want to talk podcasting, come to the Better Podcasting section. But maybe you want to talk about one of the other fine topics that we've got available to talk over there. My personal, personal favorite section is the channel that is dedicated to SP's beard. Lots of beard love going on over there as the beard is set to come off probably before we podcast next time. Then it becomes a little bit of a, a memory channel. It's just until the next time we in, talk about our fond memories. In memory of an, yeah. until October. Yeah, exactly. There you go. On that note, for episode 221 of Better Podcasting, I'm Stephen John Drew saying, SP, I guess I need to bow to you now. And I'm SP saying, for the next few weeks, my wife will be cutting my hair. We'll talk to everybody in two weeks. Bye. for checking out another episode of Better Podcasting. You can find the full back catalog of Better Podcasting at betterpodcasting.com. If you're into geeky podcasts, please check out the other podcasts on the Gunna Geek Network at gunnageeknetwork.com. This show was produced and edited by Stephen John Drew of Gunna Geek Productions. Voice work was done by L.W. Salinas. Thanks again for listening or watching. And we hope to see you again next week.